Good afternoon. My name is Claire Clark and I am from Dynam. We are supporting Highlands and Islands Enterprise to deliver this event today. It's great to have you all with us for this next session in our Nexus webinar series. A very warm welcome to you all. Before I pass over to Andrea McCall from HIE, I'd just like to spend a minute explaining how we will run today's webinar. As an audience member, you are automatically muted, but we have a couple of ways for you to get actively involved. You can use your question box at any point throughout the webinar, and we will pick up as many as we can during the Q&A. You'll also see an icon called the raised hand icon and during question time. If you've got a mic and you want us to take you off mute so we can connect you directly with our speakers, then just click on the icon and we'll get you connected. And finally, we always want to promote knowledge sharing and collaboration, so we do record every session. We will, of course, share the recording after the event so you can watch again or share with anyone else you think may be interested. That's all from me just now. I'll pass you over to Andrea, who will introduce today's speakers. Andrea. Thank you, Claire. Um, yes, I just wanted to welcome you to today's webinar. Um, I'm Andrea McCall. I work in the Life Sciences team at Highlands and Islands Enterprise. And I just wanted to give you a bit of background on our Nexus webinar series. So it's an opportunity to find out more about what is going on in our life sciences, health and technology community, and also make new connections. And in case you don't know, the next a Nexus is our co-working space in Solasta House on Inverness campus, where we have life sciences and technology companies co-locating and collaborating. And Nexus is funded by the Inverness and Highland City Region Deal and European funding. So um, today I'm um, just uh, delighted really to welcome um, two Carolines. We have Caroline Peggett from HGF Limited, an intellectual property firm and Caroline McLennan, a colleague of mine um, from the innovation team at HI. And they will tell us more about intellectual property with a focus on trademarks specifically, although other things can be covered and asked about as well. And also explain the resources that are available to businesses and the support that's also available from HI. So without further ado, I'm handing over to Caroline to start her slides. Thank you very much, uh, Andrea, that's great. Uh, okay, so I am trying to share my slides now, but if you let me know if you can't see them or if you can, that would be ideal, everybody. Yep, Caroline, we can see them perfectly, thank you. Super, thank you so much. Um, well, yes, thanks very much everyone for uh, joining. Um, fairly whistle-stop uh, tour on importance of IP and IP management. Um, so, if you've got any questions, I think we'll have a fair chunk of time at the end to, to talk about that. So scroll it down and uh, we'll take it from there. So I'm going to start off with a really high level look at why is IP important? So first of all, types of IP, trademarks, patents, copyrights, designs, and trade secrets, they are mostly what we're talking about here. And the reality is every business has IP. If you've got customers, you need to be able to identify yourself to them. So you will have a trademark, you will have a brand. Whether or not you're brand centric, not necessarily, though obviously a lot of you on the session will be. So what we've got in this pyramid of triangles um, are some of the sort of key words that I would say really identifies why IP is so important. As I've mentioned, identification. If it allows your trademark allows you to be distinguished from your competitors. So it's absolutely the source identifier is the key function of any trademark. IP at a more general zoomed out level is all about creativity and innovation. It's about coming up with something that's new and that's different. Um, your reputation is governed by the goodwill and the value in, in your trademarks, in your brand. So you think about your, your company being, you know, having a personality. All of the character traits that your company has, that is all IP. The values that you have, so whether you are 
you know, obviously got the, the COP26 happening at the moment. The values of a company, if you are big on recycling, you will reflect that in your IP, in your communication. So every bit of coffee on your website has copyrights attached to it. Every photo that you upload onto social media and, and your logo, your trademark, everything, that is all IP. Um, it helps raise funds, uh, really early doors in a due diligence exercise. You will be asked, what have you done to protect your IP? So if you're looking to get investment in, in due course, you will need to be paying a lot of attention to IP. Um, and it's that sort of customer engagement, customer experience um, that's really important too. So I'm hoping the fact that you've signed up for this session means you get that IP is important um, anyway, but just in case you needed that, that last little bit of persuasion, um, that's, that's why we've included that slide here. Uh, so what is good IP management? Well, you'll see on the left of the, the slide here, I've got four things. I'm saying identify, detect, commercialize, and enforce. And if we sort of break that down a little bit, I mean, first of all, you need to understand and accept that, that the IP is important. And I guess the reason I've included that is it's that link in your mind between it being a cost and an investment. Um, I think probably one of the things I sometimes will rely on is, is to liken it to the gym. I hate the gym personally, but that's academic. Um, if you pay a subscription to the gym you know, every month, is it a cost or are you actually sort of investing in your physical health, mental health, all the good things that, that come from that? Um, and I think that's important because if you, if you see IP as burden as a cost for something else you've got to do on your list um, you're always going to resent and begrudge it to a degree and that's not helpful because as I've mentioned it is your entire reputation and the goodwill that best in the business so we want you to like it um, identifying what you have is actually sometimes harder than you think because as I mentioned you know every bit of, every bit of website every photo every name does a strap line count? Um, identifying the different types of IP, because it is omnipresent, that's no small thing. And that is so, so important. Because if you don't know what you've got, you don't know what you need to protect. Um, making the sort of big sweeping statements of, oh, we just want to protect the name, for example. Well, what for? Where? The IP strategy that you create needs to be practical within budget, achievable from both a, a time perspective and a money perspective. Um, and there needs to be links, very clear links with your commercial objectives. Um, so actually building IP into your business plan is really important. Again, if you're looking for funding, you need to make sure you've, you've got key milestones met if that's a requirement of the due diligence exercise to achieve that funding. Um, I suppose the penultimate bullet point, I would say this, I work for HGF, um, I'm a trademark expert. Um, it is possible to, to protect a lot of your IP by yourself. Um, and I would be misleading you if, if I didn't say that was the case. Um, but it will depend on the business, whether that is sensible or not. Um, working with professionals and experts and seeking advice, whether that's from Kai or somebody like me, it's always worth doing. Don't, don't guess at it. Um, and then the last one, paying ongoing attention to your IP. Um, it's not one of those things where if you get a trademark, you then just put it in a cupboard for 10 years. It needs to be something that is living, that is breathing, that is constantly at the forefront of your mind to think, do we need to update anything? And that should be built into your strategy. There's tiers of importance. So yeah, of course, get the tier one stuff done first. But don't forget about the tier two stuff, the tier three stuff. As your business pivots, there will be IP consequences and impact on that. So not putting it in a drawer 
um, I think is, is prudent advice. All of those things help you commercialize and ultimately enforce your IP against third parties if that is required, which of course is the point so that you preserve and protect the value in your business. Now, I did say whistle stop tour. So that is my initial view on why is IP important? And then what does good IP management look like? I think it probably makes sense at this point for me to pass to Caroline M to explain how Hi um, can help and what other support there is um, to help you do all of that. So Caroline M, I will pass to you if I may. Hi Caroline, thank you. Can I just check if you can search you you can see my screen. Hi Caroline, yeah, we can see it perfectly. Thank you. Great, okay. Welcome everybody. Thank you, Caroline, for, for the first part of our IP webinar. My name is Caroline McClellan. I work with Hi's innovation team with a food and drink specialism. I want to go over some useful resources today and support um, from Hi to help manage your IP. Uh, first of all, um, I want to just talk about the Intellectual Property Office. So every business will own some form of intellectual property, but do you know how to protect these assets? I would encourage you to look at the IPO's website to consider where you might be vulnerable. The website contains a wealth of free information, but we would always caveat that, that if you have an issue with IP that requires us an IP specialist rather than just some advice from, from us or looking at a website, that you should really seek professional advice from a qualified IP specialist. But that said, the IPO website is a really good place to start. It's split into sections and covers a comprehensive library of resources, and it's actually relatively easy to navigate. I'm going to go just into a few more details on, on what's actually on there. The IPO also have a free helpline, so if you're not sure where to start, they can offer some signposting. If there is a charge for a piece of work, they will let you know in advance. For example, if you were looking for a specific trademark search. I've used the service before and found them to be really knowledgeable and approachable. So I would always recommend that you pick up the phone and, and call the, the helpline if you aren't quite sure where to start. Another resource that, that we use quite frequently on here is the IPO Health Check. So it's an online tool that helps you consider what areas of your business need to be addressed. The tool is split into nine modules and will consider areas such as trademarks, websites, design, copyright, and working with third parties. By answering a series of simple questions, it creates a tailored confidential report for you based on the information you've provided. The report will include a personalized list of actions to take, an explanation of why each recommendation is made, and guidance on how to put each course of action into practice and it links to useful information, websites, and other resources. Now your progress is saved, so you don't have to complete all the modules in one go. You'll be able to go back later and log in and pick up from where you left off. Or if there's a particular module which you feel is relevant to you at that point, then you can just do that, that single module. The Health Check is a self-diagnostic tool, so it's only as good as the information that you put into it. Therefore, if you miss anything important, it could leave you a little bit vulnerable. These types of tools are better completed by a couple of people within the organization just to reach consensus and to give a more accurate picture of where the business is at. I want to cover off now the, the um, IP audit scheme, which is for SMEs only. This piece of work is very similar to the IPO health check, but it's personalized and has the benefit of being undertaken by an IP specialist rather than an individual actually within the organization. And this is a very comprehensive piece of work over an eight week period, which looks holistically across the business and highlights any risks or limitations to a business and how to manage them. The long term, long term goal is to ensure that the business have a structure for their IP and a basic IP register. It will also highlight their strengths and weaknesses and integrate IP into their wider business strategy. And this will be on a short, medium and a long term basis. A qualified IP specialist will provide you with a report with a prioritised action plan with clear cost projections, the delivery of the services required to take forward from the recommendations. This allows the business to effectively budget in order to manage the development and protection of their IP, and it balances the risks of good IP management against the associated costs and affordability. Now, an IP audit costs around £3,000, with grants available of up to £2,500, and the number of IP audits that we have on hand is limited over a 12-month period, Therefore, any potential inquiry should be discussed with HIES innovation team um, as soon as possible. 
I wanted just to give you a couple of examples of IP audits that we've held recently. So the first one is for the Scottish Association for Marine Science Research Services Limited, based in Argyll. SRSL is underpinned by cutting-edge science, and an IP specialist recently carried out an extensive IP audit for them, which positively impacted the way the business operates, and bringing IP to the forefront of activity and decisions. And more importantly, the audit has helped them develop an IP strategy and key learnings have been shared across the organisation. And this has stimulated a cultural change in all the way employees think about IP. And they're now looking on how their IP can actually generate additional revenue for the organisation. It's a bit, as Caroline mentioned, it's about making your IP work for you. The second one is the Highland Liquor Company. Um, established in February 2008, they've created a wide range of intellectual assets, including bottle designs, recipes, training, internal procedures and processes, brands and market knowledge. Currently sales are UK-wide through national distributors to high-end retailers and through online sales. The organisation is now looking to expand to Europe and internationally and are keen to protect their intellectual property, covering work with third-party contractors, copyright, design rights and trademarks. So they're looking to take up a number of recommendations from the report and for that they're going to use the new IP access scheme to support the growth of the business and I'm going to talk a little bit about that now. So the IP access scheme launched in August 2021 so it's very new to all of us. This is a very new scheme designed to provide funding of up to £5,000 including VAT for professional IP services. Now this package is targeted again at SMEs but those that have received a part funded IP audit Please note businesses must have been awarded their audit between April 2020 um, and March 2022. Because it's so new, it's not possible to provide any examples of the scheme yet, but we have several companies who are eligible and are considering taking up the opportunity. Any organisation who are looking to have an IP audit approved over the next few months will be able to take advantage of the new IP access scheme, so it's something to bear in mind if you, if you are thinking about one for the future. And the funding is only in place at the moment until March 2022. It may continue post that if, if there's enough interest and they see the benefits. We also have um, access to IP specialist advice. These are usually more complex in nature, um, such as trademarks that are disputed, working collaboratively with another partner or non-disclosure query, queries, and are looking for advice. And there's some examples here of businesses we worked with. Now, initially, this is a service that provided by the Highs Innovation team. But if we have something more complex, we have another tier that we can go to before we go to um, a kind of specialist IP um, bureau, a contractor. So Highland Crackers makes an, a range of award-winning artisan crackers, which sell in high niche uh, delis. The business was looking to provide their product to a well-known brand looking to use their recipe. A specialist advice was sought to discuss an NDA the business had been asked to sign. On review, there was a statement within the NDA which stated the recipe would then belong to the branded company and the client was able to challenge this following advice and the issue was resolved. Second example here is Studio Vans, who provide an innovative installation system to convert standard vans into camper vans and they use their own fit-outs manufactured on UIST or from collaborations with partners and designers and artists worldwide. They came across a possible issue during the trademark application with the IPO and Studio Vans received special support from the innovation team during this process. This resulted in the trademark sub subsequently being approved. And finally, Mella Soap was established in 2016 in Ernst, the most northerly of the Shetland Islands. They turned a passion for making soaps and lotions into a business by creating a range of natural palm oil-free skincare and soy wax candles. Unfortunately, they've also faced a contested trademark and have used a specialist advice to help resolve this issue. I want to leave you with Highs Innovation Team's contact details. There's no wrong door and we're happy to be contacted from any organisation in any sector. Generally split the sectors between us. I work with food and drink companies, John works with technology and engineering and Karen with energy and life sciences. But as I say, we're happy to take any inquiry from, from any organisation within the, the high region and we can um, signpost you accordingly. I'm going to hand back to Caroline P now for some additional case studies. Thanks very much, Caroline, that's super. Um, it's, it's really lovely to hear um, the impact and sort of real life uh, stories um, because in some ways I operate in a bit of a vacuum 
and somebody comes to me if there's a problem and I do my best to fix it and then send them on their merry way. But what I think is so lovely is you have that ongoing relationship in many cases. Um, and it's, yeah, it's great. And the, the IP audit scheme, just to, to reiterate what Caroline was saying, is absolutely fabulous. It's, it's good on two fronts because it, um, it helps you. And like Caroline mentioned, there's so much funding, but uh, also it's a real opportunity for the IP specialist to get to know you with it not being at your cost. So it's, it's mega. Everyone that I've worked with that's, that's done it has said it was thoroughly worthwhile. So do, do think about that. Um, so um, can I just check everyone can see case study one on, on the screen just now? Yes, Caroline, we can see the case study one, thanks. Perfect, and that means you can see the friendly object, that's lovely. Um, so my case studies that I'm going to run through are, are made up, they're not, they're not like Caroline's real, real stories, um, but that's really because it helps prove a point, real life is messy and doesn't involve as many options as it perhaps should. So we've got this first one here. Um, let's pretend that we are the top bit. So we are otters. And what otters has done, uh, so that's the name of them, they've made a, a rehydrating face cream. Uh, they're aiming it at, at swimmers, whether wild swimmers or um, in, in indoor pools. Um, it's brand new. Uh, they've registered a name at company's house. Uh, they've got a domain sorted. And they've also developed a logo um, for a sort of otters swim cream. They're cracking on. I think they're being quite organised. They're, they're happy. They haven't gone down the trademark route yet. They've just launched. However, if we scamper down to the bottom of the slide, we can see Otter Bank Cosmetics. They have been trading since 2017 and they have got amongst other things, a trademark for Otter Lake. Now, a bunch of stuff going on here. So you've come across Otter Bank Cosmetics. You think, okay, well, our name's Otters. They're Otter Bank. Plus, they're not even using Otter Bank. They're, they've registered Otter Lake. Um, you look into them, and it's, they're nothing to do with swimming. It's, it's, it's an absolute start and finish cosmetics firm. And you think, we can quite happily coexist. Um, let's get on with our lives. Except because Otter Lake has been registered in 2017 and it isn't yet vulnerable to revocation, which takes five years and trademarks, and because Otter Lake is protected for cosmetics, which includes face creams, moisturizers, things like that, it doesn't matter that it's not aimed at the same field as you, you are in quite a sticky situation saying that otters is fundamentally different to otter lake. The point I really would like to stress here is the practical use that has been made is not relevant. So if Otter Bank Cosmetics uses the name Otter Bank to sell its goods, that doesn't matter if the trademark isn't yet five years old. So they can have Otter Lake, having never used it, not once, if it's in relation to the same goods and services, you could still be in a pickle trying to trade under otters. And so the moral of the story is beware earlier rights. Um, Callan showed you the, the IPO website. They do have a search function for trademarks there. Um, that's a good starting point. There is then a sort of spectrum of other searches that you could carry out or have carried out. Um, the earlier registered rights can be extraordinarily disruptive to a new business because that commercial brain that you've got, that practical, we don't bump into each other, that doesn't necessarily mean the problem doesn't exist. So you must be careful before you crack on that you're not treading on anyone's toes because if they've got a registered trademark they're in a very good position. Um, so that is otters and the next one that I've made up, um, Stegosaurus. So again we're at the top so we've got Stegosaurus back therapy and what we've done 
um, is we've created this new spine mat. So imagine a sort of spiky yoga mat type situation to help with back pain. That's what we've come up with. We've got an online shop in the UK, um, and we also sort of have complementary services of set up physiotherapy um, centers, massage, and yoga classes. So it's all about keeping keeping backs straight and strong and absent from pain. Come up with the name Stegosaurus, and that's great. Looking to rapidly expand to the EU and Canada in, in this game. Um, so we filed a, a UK trademark for the Stegosaurus um, in various classes. Trademarks are always split into 45 classes and you've got to pick the ones that apply to what you're doing. So we filed, we filed an application for Stegosaurus in say four different classes. Then we're trying to raise some money. So we park the idea of trademarks for a bit and turn our attention to, to raising some investment. We get round to filing trademarks in the, the EU and Canada maybe seven or eight months later. And that, we've already gone wrong at that point. Remember what I said about not putting stuff in the, in the box and forgetting about it? We need a proper strategy right from the go. So trademarks have a six month priority chain. And what that means is you can time travel effectively for six months. So you file in the UK first, you can file overseas within the next six months and it will get that first filing date. If you wait seven or eight months and a third party has come along and filed in the interim for a similar mark, and they might have seen you online, so it might be quite malicious or they could have just independently come up with the same or a similar name. For, for comparable services and, and goods. If you file within the priority period, you get to time travel and hop back. If you don't, if that you go past that six month period, you're behind them in the queue. And then when it comes to actually crunch time with your, with your funding round, you might be sat there with an opposition in the EU or Canada or whatever. The other thing I talked about, sort of managing your, your business plan with time, Pick Canada because they're really slow. They can, they're taking around 18 months to even look at trademark applications at the moment. So your filing date is the big deal. Um, but factoring that in, you won't necessarily know if you're going to have an issue for maybe 18 months in Canada at the minute. And so building this IP strategy, which would be something that you would look at in like an IP audit, um, to say, well, when do we file? When do we need to? the funds to do this, what are the milestones in that journey? That's all really useful information. Um, so the other the other little thing I've I've nipped in there, you see on the left hand side I've got at the bottom incomplete spec. What I mean by that is I mentioned that we've got the 45 classes. I said that we'd filed in in four classes just in the game. But just to run through a bit of an example with a business like Stegosaurus. You've got physiotherapy equipment in class 10, oh, great. but the actual physio services are in class 44. Okay, 10, 44. You've got sporting equipment and at large in class 28, sorry. And then yoga mats are in class 27, oh, or if you miss that. Then yoga teaching is in class 41, or if you miss that. And then sports clothing would be in class 25. So depending on how thorough you are or how much you let your trademark expert know about your business, you can miss things that are really important because the classification system in some ways is quite logical, but in others, you could be afraid of throwing a curveball. And if your application doesn't contain everything it needs to, again, pickles can follow. Um, so like I say, real life is messier which is why it's easier for the purpose of something like this to make, to make it up. But I suppose what I want you to understand is that the strategy of everything um, is really important. Otherwise, you can have a lot of stress and a lot of extra money uh, that could have been avoided. Um, that, was, that was me. That was my case, make my case studies. Um, contact details here. Um, I'm very happy for people to 
uh, pick up with questions just now or if you need to some time to form it um, my email address is there if uh, if you want to pick up later or something I said didn't make sense by all means get in touch um, but otherwise um, I think it makes sense to, to go back to uh, Claire and see if uh, and Andrea and see if there are any questions from the from the attendees that have I've been listening to Caroline and I, but, uh. from Leslie she's saying I've had a website designed can I use the images branding that were used on the website design on other promotions so for so really do I own the work now uh, Caroline do you I, I'm, I'm happy to start I'm happy to take that Caroline is a, a specialist. I've, I've got a view, but I'd rather have the specialist view. <laughs> Fair enough. Um, it's um, it's more bad news, I'm afraid, Leslie. I was I was I was quite negative with Morphin's answer as well. Um, the fundamental principle with IP is whoever creates the work owns it. So if the website developer has created something, it is their IP. Remember, it's that. It's that creativity and that innovation that is being rewarded in the form of intellectual property rights. So even though you've paid for it and logically you think I've asked them to do it, I've given them the parameters within which to do it, I've paid them for it, that doesn't mean you own the IP. Now, most people will engage in discussions about it and you know give you either a a perpetual license or an assignation or at least an undertaking to provide assistance to any future web designer web developer that you work with but if you don't have those conversations at the start you're a little bit over a barrel um, and that same situation arises with photographers as well if they've created it the default position is that they own it even if you've paid them to do it the only exception, I think, is um, architects form. But generally, you need to have an agreement that either you will own it, splitting out, um, or the, the terms of a license that you are both happy with. So, sorry, more bad news. <laughs> that's okay. Um, that's a, that was a great answer. So, you think really the best thing is to get something agreed in writing before that's really clear as to what happens with 100%. yeah with so that they so that it's clear who can use it after yes and that yeah. might even be just sending the terms and conditions that nobody ever reads and just agrees to on to somebody else to say can you can you tell me what this means can you but look for the clause that talks about ip um because yeah it's it's much better to do it at the beginning of the uh, of the project Great, thank you. Um, oh, we've got someone joining us, have we, Caroline? <laughs> yes, it's okay, she's gone. <laughs> um, okay, question from Keith. How much does it cost to register a trademark typically? Um, good question. Um, I'm afraid I'm going to give a loyally answer. Um, it depends. Uh, the, there is a positive correlation between the number of classes that you include in an application and the associated costs. So in that, uh, in the Stegosaurus example, when I was listing off all the different things, it's cheaper to apply for a trademark in one class compared to in six classes. Now, um, if you do it yourself, um, the UK IPO's official fees are 170 pounds for the first class and for each additional class thereafter, uh, 50 pounds. Um, if you work with somebody like me, um, that is more expensive. Um, so our the one class, uh, including the, the UK IPO fees, you're around the £970 mark from start to finish. So that's drafting it for you, filing it, processing it, dealing with all of that nonsense. For each additional class thereafter, you're another, I think it's £135. Um, once registered, a trademark lasts for 10 years. Again, I'm going to encourage you all to think about the um, is it a cost, is it an investment thing. Um, this is the UK trademarks. I should also say every jurisdiction has their own system. IP is a jurisdictional beast. So if you want protection in other territories, 
and to protect in those separate territories and the costs are different in each country. Um, but in answer to your question, depending on how many classes you need, somewhere north of £170 if you do it yourself, um, and ballpark £1,000 if you get um, HGF to help you. Great, thank you. And sticking with the cost theme, um, to Caroline M, um, roughly, so this next question is from Douglas, roughly how much does an IP audit cost? Right, so the IP audit cost is £3,000, that's um, the, the cost of the actual audit. The company is responsible for paying £500 of that, but they don't have to pay the whole £3,000 out. It works really well in that the, the IPO will um, be invoiced um, for the IP specialist element, which is 2,500, and then invoice the business separately for the five, 500 pounds. So it's a, a really good grant towards a really comprehensive piece of work. The only thing we've got to bear in mind is that they should have uh, the approval in place before they this, the work is started. But yeah, so it's a great, um, great, it's a great offering from the IPO. But we are, we are fairly limited in terms of those. But it's great to have the access funding coming in on the back of that as well. Um, so on the previous question where you were talking about trademarks, if you'd had an IP audit within the qualifying period, then the IP access scheme would pay for the IP specialist time in terms of all the registration of, of and all the paperwork, but it wouldn't pay for the actual trademark element. So it's a good, it's a good piece of work. Yeah, that's a great help. Um, great. Um, okay, next question from Iona Campbell. If you create intellectual property as part of an employment or contract, isn't it usual for the contract to remove the IP rights from the original creator to the company whose interests the work was created for as part of the contract? Yes. Their default position under the law is employers own the IP that you create in your capacity as um, an employee. So, um, which is where if you, you know, go back to the example before about the web, website developer, um, it's not going to be Bob who you worked with who owns the IP. It's Bob, uh, Bob's company, the, the website development company. So yes, the default position is if you are an employee, assuming it is the IP has been created within the normal uh, role that you have been assigned to uh, to do, they will own the IP. Starts to get a little bit grey if you create something on a work lap laptop at your weekends. It's got nothing to do with the business. Who owns that? That starts to become a little bit awkward. Generally, uh, yeah, employers have the rights. Great, thank you. Um, next question from Kevin. What type of IP is the one that small businesses usually forget about that is really important? Great question. Good question. Okay, well, I can, can I, I'll, I'll go and then Caroline, you'll see, see, what, uh, see what you think it might be. Um, I think it's probably the thing we, I think it's, it's maybe two things. It's either something like the website, if they're, if they're shelling money out, they just assume they've got it. So I think that's quite high up the list. Um, I think it might also be if you've got a logo made by a design agency, you think that gives you rights in a trademark sense, and it doesn't. So I think people think, oh, I've got my logo developed, so I've protected my logo. But unless you've actually filed the trademark, um, you haven't. So I think there's the, there's the creative element of coming up with something, and then there's the legal element. I have to say to people at least five times a day, I am not creative in the slightest. I am the legal side of this. Um, so that's what, yeah, that's my vote. But Caroline, you might you might have a, a different perception or a, from, the, from the people that you speak to um, on, a, on a daily basis. Yeah, no, I, I don't disagree with that. I think that's that's probably probably right. But I think very often businesses will think about, you know, 
who's infringing on my trademarks and my, my IP without actually sometimes thinking, have I created something that's actually infringing on someone else's trademarks? And that's when we, and I think when businesses start out as a start out company very much, the IP can get left behind and then they have to go back later on and, and maybe sort out issues that have been created as a result, maybe not thinking about in the first instance. They may go on and register a name in company's house without actually searching and thinking, are there any other, a bit like the Otter example, are there any other companies with, with very similar names? So it's about um, taking IP seriously from the outset really and making sure you're not infringing on anyone's IP um, because that can only cause, you know, massive amount of distress to you later on. So you just want to make sure that that you're as squeaky clean as you can be as well. Great, thank you. Um, next question from Ian Taylor. We have reached a stage of development of an app which is now ready for bringing to market. The pilot and development stages involved published academic work at international conferences. Is this good proof of our IP and how can this be used to protect us or how can we claim against other similar work? Uh, there's quite a lot in that. So, if you're talking about code, then the appropriate IP is copyright. Copyright is narrower than trademarks in, in a sense because copyright only protects against actual copying. So, that if there is a third party that independently creates something that's pretty similar to yours, um, TAF is, is, is the mechanism. And that's where copyright and trademarks are really quite, quite different creatures because it doesn't matter if somebody has maliciously copied you or has independently come up with something quite similar to you. If you have a registered trademark, they can't have it. Whereas copyright, as I've said, um, it really is copying. So it's useful that you have a sort of line in the sand, as it were, in terms of I can demonstrate that the, the, the work was in existence at this date. Um, you know, we used to have people who were putting a, you know, putting something in an envelope and sending it to themselves by recorded delivery through the through the postal system. Um, now people just email themselves and things of that nature. So you need to be able to demonstrate when it was in existence. But if somebody is also releasing something that's in the same sort of space as you, that you can't demonstrate or infer that they have copied and it's literally just you both identified a, a comparable gap in the market um, it's a little tricky and I would say the better approach is to try and gain traction in the marketplace by establishing yourself as either the first to market or the market leader in terms of just being the, the better respected brand uh, and putting resource into your trademark protection and your marketing spend to, to establish yourself as the go-to um, app for whatever the market is. Um, I hope that's helpful. I've maybe not addressed all elements of it, um, but um, I'm happy to pick up with you if I've, if I've not answered the, the one that you wanted me to um, sort of off, off with. Ian has just messaged to say thanks very much. Good answer. So. I think that was perfect. Thanks, Caroline. Um, okay, I think we've got time for one more question. This is from Gillian. She is asking, how do you choose which IP firm or patent attorney to use, especially when starting out and need to watch your costs? Do you want me to take that, Caroline? Or? I think I'm probably conflicted. <laughs> All right. Okay. So if, if we're working with organisations, normally if, if they're looking for, say, an IP audit or any um, um, support for that, we would normally send them a list of consultants that they can look to. So that they're, we wouldn't really recommend any one consultant over others, but we can usually provide a list of um, registered um, IP specialists that our organisation can go to, whether it's for patents or an IP audit or for registering trademarks. So we can usually signpost you to uh, a, a group of advisors and you can pick the one which you feel best meets the needs of your business because they'll all be very different you know they'll have different different specialisms so we can normally do that kind of signposting piece for you hope that helps 
Great, thank you so much. Um, that is all the time we have for questions, um, but thank you both so much for answering all the questions so thoroughly. Um, I am just going to pass back over to Andrea, who will say the final few words, um, and thank you very much to both Carolines. Thank you, um, both Carolines, really, and, and Claire for managing um, our question and answer session. That was really interesting. And, you know, so many intricacies in it, obviously, and your case studies illustrated how complicated some things are. But I really uh, think you brought it to life and, and you made it really tangible for us all, which is great. Um, so I just wanted to highlight our next webinar. Um, it will be on the 23rd of November in the morning at 10 o'clock and we'll speak about the technology placement program that is offered by Highlands Alliance Enterprise. So my colleague Lizzie Blackwood will tell us a little bit more about the program and to bring it all to life we will have Cecilia Greger from Planet Scotland join us as well who actually has taken um, the opportunity and hired someone through the technology placement program and she can share a little bit more about what benefits that brought to her business. Um, and then the other thing I just wanted to mention as well is that we are, um, have our Pathfinder Accelerator program, which is offering business support for any small business um, that is looking to maybe launch a new product or service or even just set up um, new as well. And we are recruiting at the moment for our next cohort that will start in January next year. And the application deadline for this one is the 14th of December. If you wanted to just maybe find out a little bit more and, and just check if this is really something for you or what's involved, you can um, email the email address pathfinder at skillfluence.co.uk to just request a one-to-one -one call with one of the coaches who can explain a little bit more about the program. Okay, that's um, that's all for me. So again, want to thank uh, Caroline and Caroline uh, for giving a really interesting overview today and uh, answering all those many questions, which is fantastic. And thanks to Claire also for hosting the webinar for us today. And thank you all for joining. And um, there's quite a few of you on today, which is great to see. Okay, see you next time. Thanks, Andrea. On behalf of Highlands and Islands Enterprise, thank you very much for a great session today to both Carolines and a final big thank you to everyone that came in to join the webinar. Our post event survey will pop up straight after this session. So if you could take a couple of minutes just to complete for us, that would be really, really great. Um, thank you very much all for your time today and have a great rest of the day.